Uh, hello, everybody. I've never spoken to so many people, so it's absolutely terrifying to be up here. Um, I'd like to thank Vicky for that nice introduction. I've never been called very esteemed before. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm here, uh, as Vicky mentioned, I'm here to talk about uh, Python's role in, in unlocking the secrets of the universe with the James Webb Telescope. So I'm sure you're all aware that yesterday um, was the first release of um, the science images taken with JWST. And we're very glad we could organize President Biden to present the very first one on Monday, just in time for Europe Python. Um, so yeah, the timing has worked out very well. Um, when I was first asked to do this, I thought, oh, this is great because there's so much Python involved in the develop, like in, in what we have done with web. And I thought, oh, I have so much to talk about. But when I actually sat down to do it, there was just too much. Okay, so I'm only going to give you an idea, uh, basically with my experience, colored by my involvement with the mid-infrared instrument. Um, but bear in mind that 90% or more probably of the analysis tools, the simulators and so on, were developed in Python, okay, and, and use Python. So um, the way I want to structure this talk a bit is to give people an introduction to the telescope and the mission and what's been going on for the last few months and talk a little bit about the Python tools we use to calibrate the data and to, to do simulations, which we use for testing and, and so on, and commissioning. And then finally, I, I'll, I'll show the images from yesterday for those who haven't seen them, along with a few others that weren't uh, released um, as part of the announcement, but have since been released. Okay, so the, the James Webb Space Telescope, it, it was this, is built on the success of the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, it was designed and built to answer questions Hubble just couldn't do because Hubble looks at a specific part of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, from uh, kind of near UV to infrared, to, to near infrared. Um, but Webb is a, an infrared instrument, or a, or a telescope, a pure infrared telescope. So it looks at a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It was designed to see the very first stars in the universe. Okay, so it needs a big mirror to collect enough light to see those. Um, and the big mirror also provides fine detail in the images so you can resolve uh, a very fine structure in your images. It needs to be cold because it's an infrared instrument most are an infrared telescope. Most people will understand infrared as being heat radiation. So if you want to observe heat in the universe, you need to keep your telescope very, very cold because if you don't, if this thing was on the ground, uh, a great analogy I once heard was it'd be like standing in the middle of a football stadium with the floodlights on at night trying to see the stars. You just wouldn't see anything. You'd be overwhelmed by the heat from, from, um, from the telescope. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a big thing. All right. It's a, it has a footprint of a tennis court. And this is a picture taken from 10 years ago when the full-scale model was here in Dublin at the Museum of Modern Art in Kilmainham. Uh, and, th and this is that picture, and uh, in front here you see a lot of the scientists from NASA and the European Space Agency and Ireland who were involved way back then in, you know, 2011, I think this was. But you can really see the size of the telescope, okay? And it's not trivial to put something like that in space. Um, it was overall, I mean, you know, in the announcements and so on, yesterday you heard a lot about the U.S. involvement, but really there was a big European involvement in it as well, and Canadian. So Europe supplied two of the science instruments and Canada one of the science instruments. Indeed, the platform, the telescope and so on was built by NASA, uh, who also provided one of the instruments, but the mission, the telescope itself was put into space by Europe. It was launched on an Ariane 5 rocket. Um, as I mentioned, it's an infrared telescope, so it looks at sort of heat from things. Okay, that's a very kind of general description, but it, it's, it's looking at the part of the electromagnetic spectrum um, which we feel as heat, but is actually looking at colder stuff in the universe. Uh, and there's good reason for this. So Webb's four primary science goals or themes are shown here. There's the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems, the assembly of galaxies, the first light and reionization history of the universe, and planets and the origins of life. And they are pretty big questions to answer um, for, for a, a mission. Okay, but these can only be answered using an infrared telescope uh, the size and 
at the size of web with, with its instrument suite, okay? So it, it was from the ground up designed to, uh, to address big questions in each of these four fields. Now I'm not gonna go into detail about the science uh, because this is a Python conference after all. But the four science themes are just sort of how the telescope was designed. It's also a general observatory. You can observe anything in the sky. And with that mirror and with that sensitivity and detail it can provide and the suite of instruments, it can revolutionize pretty much all areas of astronomy and astrophysics, which is why the scientific community and the astronomy community is so excited right now. And we got the first taste of this yesterday. And again, I show the images at the end. So it was launched in December 21, uh, 2021 on Christmas Day from Kourou in French Guiana. It was launched at about lunchtime, European time, and it was the worst Christmas Day I've ever had. I couldn't enjoy anything because I knew this was coming and I was so nervous. Um, and yeah, I, I had lots of drink after it, I can tell you, <laughs> when it went up safe. Um, but, but it was launched and it was an extremely successful launch. It's, it's one thing you maybe don't hear so much about that the European, um, oh, sorry, I don't know why it's flickering, but the, the, the Ariane Space Company did such a great job on the launch that they didn't need as much fuel to correct the path of the, of the rocket after the launch, um, which meant that that fuel, or the path of the telescope rather, which meant that the fuel that was supposed to have been used or could have been used wasn't, which means it's there available to extend the life of the observatory. And instead of, um, a mission lifetime of 10 years, because that extra fuel is there and it was the only consumable, it's now looking like 20 years. Okay, so that, that, that's all from the quality of the, of the launch and how it was inserted into orbit. This is a, um, the final real look we got of Webb as it was moving away from the upper stage of the rocket. And this video was taken um, by a, um, an instrument that was developed here in Dublin by a company called Railtra, Railtra Space Systems Engineering. Um, and it's just showing web being pushed off to where it's going, okay? And what happens, I, I won't let it run because it goes on for a few minutes, but you start to see the solar sail deploy when, when web started to get power. Um, and that was it, that was a, the first indication that everything had gone so well because it was on such a perfect path that it could start to deploy. Um, you know, as I said, it was a big thing. It had to be folded up to fit into the nose cone. And this was a very nerve wracking time. This deployment of the telescope took two weeks and was very slow and methodical and systematic and there was nearly 300 single point failures in this process. So any one of those goes wrong and that telescope is completely useless. Okay, so it was a phenomenal piece of engineering that they got it up there and deployed the telescope and it went absolutely perfectly. Okay. Um, and this was the day in January when, when, it, when the last deployment went, or was successful. Uh, and what's shown on the left here is kind of a, 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 a visualization tool that feeds telemetry from the telescope directly, or that takes telemetry directly from the telescope to show what's happening. And this is the moment when the final latch went in on the primary mirror, and we had a, a fully deployed telescope, and there were celebrations in the mission control room in uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where Webb is controlled from. So it was a great day. So what's been happening since then? This was back in January. Well, the telescope has undergone a six-month commissioning phase where everything gets tested out. We make sure the mirrors work okay, we make sure the instruments work okay. And it's a long, it takes a long time um, because you have to do this right. The first was the mirrors. Okay, this is, a this is an amazing image. On the left is an actual selfie taken by the telescope with one of the instruments. So each, you'll see that to, to fold a mirror up, there's, there's uh, mirror segments, okay, that have to come out and fold together. So each one of those mirror segments is a single telescope in itself. Okay, and what you need to do is you need to bring each one into focus first and then bring them into focus together to get the, the best out of the telescope. And what's shown on the left, is the selfie and what's on the right is a star in the middle of e each mirror and you can see that they're distorted you know the mirrors were just that completely out of alignment and putting everything back into alignment and getting everything uh, phased in the center and focus is a very very uh, methodical process and it, and it takes about uh, two or three months two months but they got there and this was the first real image uh, we got from web 
where now you're seeing, and this is the same selfie, just with all the mirrors focused, that everything is pointing in the right direction. They're all lit up because they're all pointing um, into, the, into the telescope pupil. And you get this image of a very boring star, okay? But it's just showing the sharpness you can achieve. The spikes are just the fraction spikes because of the optics of the telescope. But what jumps out of this image, I don't know if it is clear on, on, the, on the screen with the lights, but there's just a background filled with galaxies. Okay, it's so sensitive that no matter where you point the telescope, you will get just a field of galaxies. Okay, and actually for commissioning, for science it's great, <laughs> but for commissioning, it was just so annoying, right? They're photobombing everything. Um, <laughs> once the first instrument was focused, then they could move on to the rest. So there's four science instruments on Miri and a fine guidance sensor, which, which kind of, you know, um, keeps the telescope pointing in the right direction as it's observing. And this was the first image released for all of the instruments, including Miri up here on the top right, which is, which is what, the instrument I worked on. And again, it, I mean, uh, this, this is a field in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a nearby galaxy, so it's another galaxy. But the, the images are filled with stars and galaxies. The, the thing is so sensitive, it collects so much light, and it has such fine resolution that it doesn't, you don't, it doesn't matter where you point it, if you integrate for any little, uh, if you ex expose the uh, instruments for any short period of time, you're gonna get this rich field of stars and galaxies. It's amazing. Um, so this, this is kind of a close up now of, of what the previous best uh, space-based infrared instrument could do compared to James Webb uh, in the, in the mid-infrared wavelengths where Miri observes. So on the left is the Spitzer Space Telescope and on the right is the, is the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see the improvement is, is unbelievable. And with Miri, you start to see lots of uh, interstellar medium features and stuff, so it's, it's very well resolved. And th these, are, these were taken in a few minutes or you know, you know, a few tens of minutes. So no, ex no exposure time, basically. Um, now, th now, that's kind of how commissioning was going. Um, and then we, you know, could, um, there are instruments were commissioned and so on, and now I kind of move and tell you a bit about, well, how do we get these images? Um, because what's shown here on the right, that, that's not how the images come down from the telescope, okay? You don't just get these beautiful things. They, they look a bit more messed up, and this is a very simple example. So on the left here, um, yeah, I don't have a laser thingy, but on the left, is a raw image, okay? And you can see there's a lot of crap in there, right? This is a simulation of a galaxy core. But if you look around, you see all of these stripes and bits and pieces, and these white things are cosmic rays hitting the detector, okay? There's lots of, you can see this sort of tree ring structure up here. So there's lots of detector effects. All of that is due to the um, effects introduced by the detector, by, the, by whichever instrument you're using. What you need to do to produce the images that are released or are used for science is get rid of all of that, okay? To produce something like what's on the right. Now there's still some bad pixel areas, but that's okay because you can set up your observation to um, move the detector slightly and fill in those. But you want to remove all of the effects introduced by the detectors and by the telescope. The telescope will introduce them as well. And leave just the pure image of the sky that's well calibrated so you know the flux of what the object you're looking at, and you know, the wavelengths and the position on the sky and so on. And that's where the instrument teams come in, like myself, uh, or, you know, like the, the team I worked on, where before launch, we did years of testing of our, of our detectors and so on to, you know, understand all of these effects that were introduced, how we could correct them in orbit, uh, understand the behavior, Does, do these effects change in time, um, create calibration files which we could use in orbit to correct the data and you know refine those in orbit. And this, basically what I'm describing is a calibration pipeline, okay? What you, you, you understand various different effects and you create a, a pipeline where you send in raw data, you correct one effect, you correct the next effect and so on until you rev removed everything and it's what we call a calibration pipeline. And this is kind of a schematic of, of the stage one pipeline. And on the right is just a series of steps that introduce our understanding of the detector on the, oh, sorry, on, on, in the green is, is the list of steps. What the gray is showing is 
sort of the reference files. So these are the calibration files that we've created based on our understanding of the telescope, which are kind of can easily be changed, but the calibration step, it, the operation that that does is fixed. We just change the values based on our understanding. These calibration files are created by us and refined in commissioning. And the blue is just a description. But I'm just giving you an idea of what I'm talking about. This is how we get from raw data to um, to, the, to the public release data. So we've been over in, in Baltimore at the, the control room where I showed you and working in the Space Telescope Science Institute for the last few months, working on commissioning MIRI where we were looking at all of these effects, refining everything, creating new calibration files, making sure everything worked okay and the instrument worked as expected. Um, and this is the, the first main area where Python comes in. Now I'm not going to show any of it because I think it's still proprietary, but um, all of these cal all of these checkouts we were doing, all of this commissioning tools we were uh, testing and running and so on were all developed and built in Python. Okay, they live on a Git on a proprietary GitHub repo, um, which the which our instrument team you know uh, develops on, and it, it was used to basically commission Miri. Okay, and other instruments were exactly the same. So when we finish this process, our instrument is science ready and images such as the one you saw yesterday can be taken. Okay, we, we tick a box, the, the instrument is science ready and those observations can be taken. Other instruments have to do the same and the final checkout was uh, a few days ago where the very last science mode for James Webb was commissioned so it's fully ready for science now. Um, but what you'll see here is that there's actually a bunch of science modes, okay? So I, I've kind of talked about the various steps in calibration, but really, in practice, you don't want every astronomer doing, running these steps themselves. You need some sort of software package that will take the data from the telescope automatically, run it through these steps, and make that process data available to observers and scientists around the world so they can do the science, okay? Our job is to, make, is to remove most of this from there, stop them worrying about it. Okay, it's true that a lot of scientists will rerun everything, maybe tailor some of the steps, maybe tailor some of the values, and that's great. If, you, if we need to do that, we need to have a flexible software package that can do that, which we do. But there's basically 17 science modes for a range of different uh, kind of purposes. Across the four instruments, it's a big pain in the neck, okay? but a software package was created that basically takes the data, figures out from, you know, metadata in the, in the files what's been observed, what mode is being used, sends the data into the specific pipeline paths, and processes everything and sends it straight to um, the archive where astronomers and, and scientists can, can download it. And this is called the JWST calibration pipeline, okay? It's a Python software suite. It does have some C plugins because speed is required for a very small part of the, pi uh, of the pipeline. Python was slowing things up quite a bit. But it's but 90, like, you know, more than 90% is, is written in Python. It automatically processes data that's sent from the telescope. Um, as I said, it, you know, it it's decides which data it is, sends it through the correct path. Um, you know, calibrates it, combines it if necessary, and produces the science-ready products that astronomers will use to win Nobel Prizes, hopefully. Um, why is it in Python? Well, there's a, there's a substantial, I don't know if there's any astronomers in the room, but there's a su substantial knowledge of Python in the astronomical community. We've had tools like um, AstroPy and, of course, NumPy and SciPy for, for years now. And, you know, it, it's it's perfectly suited to, to um, astronomical data analysis because in the end they're just images, okay, and spectra, which are two, and uh, one, uh, you know, they're just NumPy arrays, basically. So um, the, the benefit of having everything together like this as well in a single uh, calibration pipeline is that it, it's easier to maintain. Uh, different teams can work. A lot of the instruments have the same calibration steps, so the teams can you know, interface over the best way to do things that will suit all of the instruments. So you have an additional expertise in there. Um, you can also, you know, it, it's developed in the open. 
for years, the JWST calibration pipeline has been openly and publicly available so the community could get used to it, start using it, um, you know, play around with it a bit. It's very flexible. It's because it's written in Python, and I'll go through it in a minute. Um, the, the steps are Python classes and so on, so it's trivial to move stuff around um, to, to better improve your calibration. For things like Hubble, people don't realize that Hubble had a, a, a lot of science modes as well, but pretty much every one had their own independent calibration pipeline, which were these monolithic chunks of code that were written in different languages, and it wasn't straightforward. If you wanted to change something, you just couldn't do it. Okay, because it just you sent in something at the top and your product came out at the bottom. Whereas here you're going through it step by step, you can save at any point, um, you know, rerun from, or you know, pause the pipeline, rerun, whatever you need to do. Okay, so before I get into how it works, the, just, just some information for yourselves. The, the observational ast astronomical data files are, are in the so-called FIT standard, okay? And it's, it, basically what you have is you have a header, with some metadata that gives you things like what instruments were used, um, you know, the dates, just, just lots and lots of data about the observation, uh, uh, metadata about the observation, and then you have a data extension, which is your actual data, like the image shown here, and you can have additional things, like if you have an error uh, image, you can have that in your FITS extension. Okay, so any, any software to process these things has to be able to read these in and I'll put them and uh, run them through a pipeline. We do that uh, for JWST, for the calibration pipeline, this is done, should I say, um, using software data models. So these files are read in to a Python object where members of the Python object correspond to different aspects of the input fits file. So if I read in the file as before, just using this very trivial, um, so it's the, it's the JWST package, so if I import the data models, uh, from the package, I can just open my FITS file, and my image, my data, is just a member of, of, of that object, so I can access it through model.data. Or if I want to check out any of the metadata, I can just go through the meta um, member and find whatever I'm looking for. And it's very flexible and very, very useful. Um, and it's, you know, it's uh, because it's Python, you can, you can import uh, you're sorry, they're defined by YAML schema, so you can just start with a base and add as you need to go and create data models for every kind of file that JWST pipeline uses, such as the raw data, such as the output data, such as the calibration data, and actually it's extremely useful for the, for the, for the instrument teams because we can use the data models to produce the exact format required by the pipeline to calibrate the data. Um, all of this is done through a package called ST Pipe. Uh, so basically, as I said, we go through a series of steps. A series of steps at one level is called a pipeline. Each step is a Python class that's based on the step, um, the, the step class. And the idea behind this is that it handles everything and leaves the instrument teams and the, the community um, free to work on the scientific stuff. So this handles everything from data input to um, parsing configuration settings, um, input and output file management, accessing the calibration files, okay, that's a big thing. Those calibration files live on a server and this package will automatically recognize from the metadata in the data model what is needed, fetch that from a calibration file server, takes all of that worry away from astronomers and the instrument teams. So we don't need to worry about it. We can just focus on what we want the corrections to be and the data to, to, to do. Okay, it handles logging and um, it has a consistent interface for, for users across all of the pipelines, across all of the instrument models. Okay, so this is, this is what the JWST calibration pipeline is based on. And I'm just gonna give a quick example. I've never given a Python talk before, so I don't know if you're supposed to show code or not. So maybe this is a big faux pas in the <laughs> Python world, but uh, I don't know if you can see it, but basically this, this is a very simple calibration step, and it, it uses the step class, as a, it inherits from the step class, okay, it's called a fringe step. All it does is divide a science image by your reference uh, array. Um, it's set up with it, so it just takes an input, opens it with the data models, gets, the calibration file, using this one line, uh, will fetch the calibration file from the server, or if it's on your local computer, it will just get it from there. It logs everything. If 
there is no calibration file, it will give you a warning and move out, uh, you know, stop the step and, and set it in the pipeline that, that it was skipped. It won't crash the pipeline, the pipeline will keep going, but you will get this warning that this step has been skipped. The, fringe, the, the calibration file is then opened as a data model, a fringe model in this case, and the correction is done in a separate function that's imported. And as I said, it's just a division of, of, of two arrays and returns the output model. So th this is a very simple version, but it gives an idea that if, you know, whatever the, like whatever the instrument teams or the scientists want to do is done in a function that's imported. All of the other things, such as the input and the output, the fetching of the calibration files, and, you know, reading of configuration, personal configuration parameters for this step. But, but all of that is handled by this STPy package and, and the step class, um, which makes things very, very straightforward. Um, each one of the, so the steps, so the calibration pipeline and step is just a series of steps. So the pipeline class is just uh, a list of step classes that are run through. Um, and again, very straightforward. If we want to um, reorder these steps, we can just move them around. If we want to remove one, we can just skip it or, or remove it. Um, I'm just giving an example here. Again, you're, you're, you're taking your, your input, reading it as a data model. And this, this is where now you're, you're starting to check for the different modes. So you read the metadata from the data model, and you see that it's a MIRI observation, and you go through the MIRI part of the pipeline. Okay? And there's logic like that built in all over these pipelines. It's extremely useful, extremely powerful, extremely modular. And because it's compared to some of the stuff you guys do, I'm sure, it's extremely simple. Okay? It's just a series of steps. Um, so in the end, what you want is you want to take all, remove all of those detector things, which I showed, which is done in the first stage of the pipeline. The second stage is just do flux calibration, and wavelength calibration, and astrometric calibration, and so on, okay, which are just you know, registering the images on the sky and making sure you have the correct flux. And, uh, and then the third is stitching everything together. So you know, in an observation, you will take a bunch of exposures. Um, calibrate them up to level two, stage two, and then stitch them all together to produce a final mosaic, such as the images you saw yesterday at level three. And all of this is handled by the calibration pipeline. Wow. <laughs> Ten minutes. <laughs> I'm going to skip the simulators. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I'm sure everybody wants to see the images and not just me rabbiting on. Um, Okay, uh, so there are, I mean, I'm not, I'll very quickly go through the simulators, but that, that was basically it for the pipeline. But, you know, to test the pipeline, to prepare for commissioning, to, to test our commissioning tools, we needed kind of real data, well, not real data, but simulated data of the sky, because all of our ground test data is on calibration sources and stuff. It's not representative of what you see in space. Okay, it's good for, you know, checking your, uh, you know, understanding your instrument and so on, but if our commissioning observations are going to be of something in space, then we need to, uh, create simulated data of something in space. And that, again, is all Python, all Python packages. In MIRI team, we, we developed this MIRI, sim, uh, MIRI simulator where we could know what we're going to observe during commissioning, simulate it with MIRI, test our tools, and in the end, it was, it was used pretty much by every part of the MIRI team. Um, and what we had in the end, sorry, I'll just, ah. What we had in the end was something like this, where we had knowledge of what we were going to observe in the sky, which is on the left, Knowledge, our, our simulations on the right, which incorporates our understanding of the instrument, its sensitivities, and so on. And this is what it actually looked like in commission. And so on the left is a simulation, and on the right is the actual observation during commission. And there's a slight offset and angle, but that's just because we were out by a degree. Um, on our way, we were out. We simulated a day, uh, two, two days later than was actually observed. But you're looking at this, the, the field on the right, and it's almost perfect. Okay, so our understanding of the instrument was extremely good because we could take that, simulate what we thought the sky should look like, and it was basically the same. Okay, so it really, uh, really allowed us to develop our, our. It was perfect for developing our commissioning tools. Post pipeline. So after the pipeline is finished and the science products come out. Um, again, there's a suite of um, Python tools to analyze the data and the images and the spectra and whatever. Uh, these are all, like, a lot of these would be quite common throughout the astronomical community. Um, okay, the images. Yeah. Now, everybody wakes back up. Um, so I'm on the knife. 
<laughs> we had uh, President Biden reveal the very first image, uh, science image with, taken with JWST. And it was, I don't know, anyone watch it? A few? Okay, that's good, because it, it was really weird. <laughs> but, um, but it gave a whole other level of publicity to the, uh, to the community, you know, to the instrument and, and so on. Obviously not in this room, because there was about five people who put their hands up. Um, but, but no, it, it was really something else. And we didn't know that President Biden was going to release the first image when he found out on Sunday. But this is the first image. It's the, it's the um, JWST first deep field, OK? It's the furthest into the universe, apart from the cosmic microwave background, which is the first light. That's absolute first light in the universe. But this is the first sort of stars and galaxies, the, the deepest images of stars and galaxies we've ever had. This was done with 12, in 12 hours with James Webb. Okay, 12 hours, that's nothing. The Hubble deep field, ultra deep field, took weeks of constant observing. Okay, okay spread out over years, but it, it, it's a week's uh, of exposure, and this is 12 hours. This was done just in just over one shift on console, put it here that way. Um, the detail in there is phenomenal. If you download the full resolution image, you could scroll around it all day. You're seeing a massive galaxy cluster in the center, and you know Einstein's general theory of relativity told us that if there's a mass in space, it deforms space-time. So if you have a very massive object in the universe, it acts like a lens because the light from behind it sees the deformity and gets bent around it. And that's what you're seeing here. So these are lens galaxies. And this isn't even lens galaxies. This is the same galaxy, just seeing a different part of the lens here. Okay, so phenomenal stuff. The galaxy cluster is at about four or five billion light years from here. You're seeing stuff in this image that's, it was emitted 13 billion light years ago, over 13 billion light years ago. So the universe was still only a few hundred million years old. Again, this is just in 12 hours with James Webb. You could scroll around and look at all sorts of funny images or funny objects like this thing here. Again, this is just deformed by the, uh, by the gravitational lens. You're seeing objects in here like these red galaxies which aren't visible in Hubble, okay, because they're so far away, the light from those has been redshifted. Redshifted means that the light has just lost energy as it moves across the expanding universe. Um, Hubble physically can't look at these galaxies because it can't see in these wavelengths. This is why James Webb was built, to see those galaxies. Um, <clears throat> the image that was released was taken with NIRCAM, but on the left is the MIRI image, so this is the, with the instrument we worked on. And this sees even further back. Now, we actually don't understand. We don't know what a lot of the objects are in the mirror image because we need to identify them, which is probably why it wasn't released yesterday uh, in, the, in the announcement. But MIRI has the potential to look even further back again, OK, because it's longer wavelength. Stuff that's further away gets redshifted to the longer wavelengths. Um, we also saw Stefan's Quintet yesterday, which is a, a, gal a small galaxy cluster interacting galaxies nearby nearby, relatively nearby. The one on the, the one here is actually a foreground galaxy. Okay, this isn't associated with, with these three, uh, or with these ones here. These are interacting, so they've been in a kind of a cosmic, uh, you know, dance for millions, billions of years. And this is the image taken with NIRCAM. So you can see the white is basically the stars. But if you look with MIRI, you start to see the interstellar medium, and you can see all this dust being spun around the galaxies. And in that dust, there's lots of stars being formed because they're, you know, there, there's turbulent motion in there and there's compression of the dust and gas and stars will, will form in there. Um, this is a near-cam MIRI composite, but the MIRI image itself is insane, okay? It looks like fireworks. Um, again, this, this is, so this is kind of a zoom in on, on the top tree here, but uh, this galaxy on the left, again, is a foreground galaxy. It's pretty standard looking for, uh, um, for a spiral, but. On the right here, you can see really how the interstellar medium is being disturbed by the interactions of those galaxies. And you can see that there's these shock fronts and clumps and everything. And here it's like there's, you know, it almost looks like the gas is swirling or the dust is swirling into the center. And this is a supermassive black hole in here, this bright object, which is only visible in MIRI, um, or, or which becomes very apparent in MIRI. Uh, okay, and again, photobombed in the background by all of these galaxies that are even further away. Okay, which were, uh, you know, consistent pain in the neck. Uh, the next image was um, the Southern Ring Planetary Nebula. This is a dying star. This is a star like the sun, which is in its last stage of evolution. And it's throwing off the outer layers of the star, exposing the hot core in the center. The hot core is on the left is a near cam image. 
and you can see the hot core uh, star, which is a white dwarf, basically, or a proto-white dwarf. Um, and the layers of the star being thrown out into the interstellar medium. On the right is Miri, but the detail in the near cam image is just phenomenal. Okay, you can see all of this layers, of, and you know there's dust and so on in here, uh, or there's, there's just gas and dust, and just layers and layers of, of uh, mass loss from the from the star um, as it dies, basically. Uh, it was always known that this was a binary star, but actually in Miri, you can see the binary. Okay, the resolution of JWST is so good, you can see the binary in there next to it. It's a dusty star, so it's not visible in near cam, but Miri resolves it. It's phenomenal stuff. This was released yesterday as well. It's the spectrum of an exoplanet atmosphere. Okay, so this is a, a hot Jupiter, basically, a big gas giant moved in front of its host star while Webb was observing. And due, because of the changes in the stellar spectrum, we could infer the content of the stellar atmosphere. And what was found was that it's filled with water vapor. Okay, so steam, basically. This is right next to its star, so it's very hot. So it's filled with steam. Now this was kind of known. What wasn't known, or what, what's different, is that these water features shown here, these bumps, are smaller than expected. The reason is that there's clouds in the atmosphere. Okay, so this is actually inferring the presence of clouds in the atmosphere of this hot Jupiter, because that, the, the, the clouds will inhibit the formation of water vapor. Okay, so just from this one observation, uh, and this, you know, it will observe things like, you know, candidates that have potential for life and, and so on. But this is a very kind of standard hot gas giant, and it's already, you know, producing these amazing results. This wasn't released yesterday. This is in our commissioning paper that was released today on, on the archive. This is Jupiter. Jupiter shines out in the infrared, okay? And I'm just showing you this, it, you know, it doesn't look anywhere near as impressive as the Hubble image, does it, right? It looks like someone shone a torch behind it, but telescope, or the telescope, James Webb is a big unit, okay? It's a big thing, but to observe something like Jupiter, it needs to be able to track it on the sky. So it does move in target analysis. So it can actually follow Jupiter as it moves along. And this, this observation with NIRCAM demonstrated that. And you can see the moons, which are also bright, the red spot, so you're actually seeing emission from Jupiter itself now, not just the reflected light from the sun. Um, and you can see its rings, okay? You can see the faint rings here. Uh, you can see lots of detector stuff in the background. That's just because Jupiter is so bright, okay? It's, it's not, um, there's nothing you can do about it when it's so bright. It's saturating the detector and so on. This one was my favorite. This is the Carina Nebula, the gas and dust in the Carina Nebula. Um, so there's massive stars up here that are irradiating this gas and dust, and you can see the, the gas and dust is evaporating off into the, into the interstellar medium. There's star formation going along in the dense parts of this, um, which, you know, can't be seen by Hubble because Hubble can't see into the gas and dust, and, and NIRCAM can't really either, but MIRI can. So if you look with MIRI, you're seeing right into where these young stars are forming. You can see the, you know, the plan is to, to look at the formation of young stars and, and protoplanetary disks. So look at the very earliest stages of planet formation. And there's lots of other things here as well. The ever-present photobombing galaxies in the background, uh, outflows from massive stars. Like you can see here, there's a, there's a jet that's carving a, a cavity in the, in the interstellar medium here. Just phenomenal stuff. And all of, all of these observations were done in one week. Okay, one week, and not even filled a week. Um, this kind of thing is routine for the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is why the next few years are going to be extremely exciting. Um, these, these targets were also chosen because they're not on the list of targets that are going to be observed in the next year. So the interesting targets have yet to be observed. Okay? I'm going to leave it with this image because it's my favorite. <laughs> and it took 20 years to build a telescope, put it in space, and now... Um, yeah, now it's a very exciting time. And all because of Python. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. That was amazing. It's really hard to interrupt you when you're showing this. It's, wow. Okay. It doesn't fit in my brain. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. If you want to ask a question, you have to stand in that microphone that is there. Um, anyone want to ask a question? Have to be quick. Um, I don't think, I, I, I'm going to say a reminder. 
if you are watching this conference remote, you can ask questions, right? So if anyone is remote, there is always an operator asking, do you want to ask a question? And you can get into a call, and then we'll put you here in the screen live with everyone. Um, so remember that for all the talks. So first one. Yeah. Uh, so what are the interesting targets? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's a list of them. Uh, so I mean, OK, every, everybody's favorite thing that it's going to do is, is the exoplanet atmospheres, OK? Because potentially you could observe life, and, and, and we'll see. So um, Webb is not a planet finder. Uh, you need to know what you're, the, you need to know the planets before it will look at them, okay? And there's, we have, how many now? Three, four thousand, more probably, exoplanets that are known. Some in, you know, some are rocky, some are known to have atmospheres, all, all of this. So they pick the best candidates of them. They will be observed in the next year. So really in the next year, there's, a, you know, somebody only asked me yesterday in an interview, you know, will we find life? Well, there's never been a better chance, um, potentially very quickly, <laughs> but... Yeah, I don't want to get everybody's hopes up on that. But yeah, oh, yeah, things like that. I mean, there's so many interesting targets, so many. Cool. Next one. Hi. First of all, uh, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. Uh, Web is such an amazing uh, uh, piece, of, uh, piece of hardware and software. Um, my question, you mentioned something about the data pipelines being open and to mm -hmm. the public. Does yeah. it also involve the data? How do we? Gets, um... Data. Okay, so so everything that was released yesterday is publicly available. Okay, oh. that that was these are so-called early release observations. Um, the raw data from them and the calibrated data, the FITS files that will um, will be available either today or tomorrow. Right. Um, they're free for everybody. There's a second program called Early Release Science, which will also become free uh, immediately available uh, to everybody um, when they're taken. Okay, so some have already been taken, so that data will become available to, today, or if, I can't remember the dates, today or tomorrow as well. Um, but as they, as they are taken in the first cycle, they will become available. The other programs, the G, so the so-called guarantee time and guest observer programs, there's a proprietary period of one year for them. So scientists have the right, because they won that time, they have the right to have it to themselves for a year to produce the science, you know, to produce papers and make the discoveries and so on. After that, it becomes publicly available. Right. Um, so basically, in a year, we can do just pip install JWST, and we can. Well, right. Well, right now you can do that. Oh, right, okay. You can just type it. Oh, anyone, right. yeah, anyone with a computer open, type pip install JWST, and it should install the software package. Um, it's the data that you want. Right. So go get that data. Download that from an archive. It's on mass. It's called Mass Archive. You can go and, and fetch it today or tomorrow, and you can start playing around with it. Right. Cool. Cool. Uh, so can I have one question? No, Just that's question. two questions. <laughs> One more. We don't have remote questions, so only one more. Sorry for the other ones. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the great talk. I was just wondering what is the size or the scale of the raw data uh, to produce one image? The scale, it depends on, so it all, it all depends on how long you integrate, so how long the exposure time is. Um, for, let me see now. So basically the way the telescope works is it, it samples the detector uh, at some readout time, okay, so it uh, takes a sample, takes a sample, takes a sample, and then you, you use that to calibrate your data. Um, it depends on how many of those samples you take. And if it's short, it can, it's only a few hundred megabytes, and now you, you will have more than one, you'll have more than one exposure, right? So you, you're talking a few gigabytes, couple of gigabytes, but if it's much bigger, then of course it just scales with the, the amount of samples of the detector, basically. So it can, yeah, it can be tens of gigabytes, probably, for the biggest. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Please give him a shout. Thanks. Thank you.